As promised, here is part four of my Miner Plan series, where I finish covering how these employee investment funds were intended to grow, what they were intended to be used for, along with a short series wrap up. The Miner Plan called for an issuing of shares representing 20% of the profit of affected companies to be placed into the wage earner fund system. Profit in this case would have been determined by the increase in the value of the assets of the company from the start of to the end of the year. Now, there are a whole host of potential loopholes and ways to counteract them. However, I will not bog down the video with explaining those, nor the complications that arise from, say, imposing this plan on a company who's foreign to the nation that's implementing this plan like this. I can say that it was substantially covered within the plan itself, and for the most part are issues that tax law has to work to address anyway. What does need to be said, however, is that these shares would be acquired based purely off of profitability within the implementing country. For example, in the case of Sweden, Swedish companies with foreign subsidiaries would see the shares would be valued based on 20% of the profits of operations within Sweden and foreign companies operating within Sweden, the same would apply. It would just be a 20% of the profits of the value of those assets within Sweden. Additionally, the value of those issued shares would be calculated before rather than after taxes, which means taxes on these corporations would decrease proportionally to the percentage of the firm owned by the wage earner funds. This actually benefits a corporation's capacity for growth, as it will be explained later in the section, uh, that covers how the wage earner funds were intended to use the value associated with share ownership. It is difficult to immediately picture what this rate of share acquisition would look like in terms of how quickly the wage earner funds would grow to hold a majority of the shares within the company at a given rate of profit. Thankfully, this diagram here is rather useful. At 5% a year asset growth, it would take around 75 years to pass 50%. At 10%, it would take around 35 years. At 15%, it would take around 25 years. I suggest in your own research as to what the yearly rates of asset growth look like for the largest corporations in the world. Let's see how that would compare. Now, for the last of the three sections of the core explanation, let's move on to the uses of the value in the funds. As mentioned before, this was not a plan to give workers shares that would be withdrawn and converted into cash. That would be allowing the workers' portion of ownership to be decreased or eliminated. In addition to forcing firms to pay out in cash, what would be better reinvested in growth? To start explaining what these funds were to be used for, we can return to the diagram that outlined the structure of the wage earner fund system. On the left side of the diagram, we see resources leave from the clearing fund and go to towards four boxes, representing education, research, expertise, and information that are further relayed towards the sector funds, unions, and small workplaces. You'll notice again, to emphasize this, that among those options, none is a direct transfer of cash to workers. One of the potential uses of the value associated with the fund, and that value would include dividends paid to the fund, would be spending it towards purchasing additional shares. However, we need to illustrate that the funds would be used to benefit general economic growth. For example, resources would go towards workplaces that would be too small to be included in the wage earner fund system perhaps as informed by community representatives within the system. Resources would have also, of course, go to unions and the sector funds for lower level planning. However, it's important to emphasize what is meant by resources, more than just listing off those four categories. The idea was to not allow a situation where wage earner funds would be used to pick up slack in an investment that would, in other cases, come from private sources, but only it would be an addition to that in ways decided within the wage earner fund system. This is not as simple as saying that X amount of resources would go into Y, as the specifics would have to be decided by the context because it would be a democratic process that this would occur in. For example, presumably in a situation where the fund system owns a majority of a company, there'd be less of a reason to worry about taking over a majority of the reinvestment, particularly since a higher rate of profitability would also mean moving even more quickly towards total ownership of that company. All of this is meant to be flexible and democratically decided. The minor plan was mostly about proposing a framework of a system that would be democratically manipulated to meet challenges as they came up. However, some things can be said about each category and why investment there would be important. The plan mentioned that the wage earner fund led research in business and political economy would be important, as while methods of research are more or less objective, what should be researched and to what end is subjective, 
a research dominated by the wealthy private sector is carried out for the ends of the wealthy private sector. So collective worker-led research ought to be carried out so that its results might closer meet collective worker ends. It is this logic that goes behind putting resources behind education, expertise, and the dissemination of information as the sources of funding for all those things helps determine the character of what actually is produced by that investment. With the structure, growth, and usage of the minor fund explained, we can move on to the conclusion. The minor plan's wage earner fund system was intended to reinforce a Swedish social democratic system that guaranteed low unemployment, low inflation, and high income equality and high growth by dealing with the tremendous growth in wealth inequality that was, in a sense, a direct result of the successes of the social democratic system operating within its limitations. But before this video concludes, two more things have to be said that will be relevant for future videos. Firstly, it is notable that the Minder Plan, in its task of addressing wealth inequality, did not concern itself so much with taking resources from the wealthy to pay workers. What it sought to do, primarily, was take resources from the wealthy for the purpose of fueling economic growth that would be increasingly owned by workers. To the extent that the lives of workers would be improved on a day-to-day -day basis, it would be mostly due to the additional economic productivity caused by the investment in growth. This is in contrast to a lot of modern social wealth fund proposals, which would essentially be used to fund a basic income. This is not a critique of either model, but an important differentiation. Additionally, it should be made abundantly clear that the minor plan was never successfully implemented as described here. In fact, political controversy over this plan played a role in the Swedish Social Democratic Party not being in government between 1976 and 1982. And then when they came back to power, a severely watered down employee fund system was proposed instead, and that was abolished when the Social Democrats lost power again in 1991. All that is a topic for a series of videos, likely not limited to the minor plan. However, I can say one thing that is relevant to that which is relevant to why I began this series over a year ago. Since I started this series, particularly within the last nine months or so before this video came out, it had become brutally obvious that our economic system cannot keep going on like it has been. But at the same time, the people demanding change are mostly spinning their wheels, proposing mismatched policies that aren't enough, won't work anymore, never worked, and or don't lead anywhere. But anyway, the minor plan is unique in that it was a tangible, practical plan to transcend the capitalism that did not require some grand, almost mythical paradigm shift or a miraculous reawakening that completely changed how people saw the world around them. To finish editorializing, I mostly find myself observing proposals and plans for progressive change that are held together mostly by magical thinking. The purpose of this channel, of which this video is a part of fulfilling, is pushing against that tendency, not simply by tearing things down, but bringing things up. That concludes my video. Please like, share, subscribe, and comment.